discussion of ventilator weaning, but you could break it down into two uh, basic categories, those who need a rapid weaning and those who have long-term weaning, so that would be the two general categories. Uh, first, let's talk about a rapid weaning. Who, what kind of patient would qualify for this? Think about what put the person on the vent. Why is the person on the ventilator and has the issue, uh, is it resolved or is it starting to resolve? And that would be the person that you would wean. The person who uh, had heart surgery, for example, would have been weaned or would have been uh, put on the ventilator during surgery and deeply anesthetized. And it may take some period of hours after they come off uh, or come out of surgery to wean. So uh, what would be some of the parameters in a quick wean that you might want to check? Well, uh, how about their cognitive ability? There's one thing. Uh, uh, neuro, I guess. We'll say neuro. Are they awake and alert? So generally, uh, awake enough to follow commands is going to be required because when I extubate you, I'm going to ask you to do certain things, and I need your full cooperation with that. Uh, what else? What else do I need to know? Anybody? Hmm? Okay, uh, respiratory rate. Well, uh, first of all, what ventilator settings are they on? Uh, assume that uh, when they came out of surgery, I might have put them on assist control or full ventilatory support with a respiratory rate and a tidal volume. So how do I withdraw that in a way that will allow us to uh, assess whether the patient is uh, able to breathe? And many people, what they'll do, and there's no right or wrong answer here, sometimes they might change a patient over to SIMV and slowly bring down the rate or the respiratory rate in certain increments. Now, as you start bringing the ventilator uh, minute ventilation down, the mechanical minute ventilation, you hope that the patient, so this is machine, you hope that the patient goes up on their spontaneous minute ventilation to compensate because you know why we put them on SIMV, right? And not assist control because in assist control, uh, you might turn the mandatory rate down, but the assist function of the ventilator is still there. And so the patient starts to take a breath, and what happens? It gives them a full breath. It takes over. It delivers a set tidal volume at a set rate. So uh, can't wean somebody in assist control. Have to now realize uh, that mechanical devices do a very good job of blowing off CO2, right? And uh, if you start to wean somebody, if the me mechanical device, let's say I've dropped your rate in half, I went to a rate of 7 from a rate of 14, and let's say that that rate of 7 and that tidal volume of 700, now we've got about 5 <coughs> liters per minute. Well, let's say that's still enough to keep your CO2 within that range of 35 to 45. Realize, if the patient's CO2 is still in range with the help of that machine, they're not going to breathe on their own. There's no drive to breathe. The patient will only get their own drive to breathe when you give their CO2 a chance to rise above 45. Now, if the machine's doing it, they won't breathe on their own. So don't be deterred just because you've started dropping their rate and the patient hasn't started breathing yet. You've got to keep going, and eventually you'll get down to a minute ventilation at where the patient should start breathing. Uh, frequently, we might get a blood gas to document that. Okay, at any rate, We've gotten the patient to uh, CPAP, and generally we uh, frequently, we used to get a lot of blood gases. These, these days we often uh, don't get the uh, blood gas until we get the patient on CPAP at least for 30 minutes. Uh, so what are some of the things that once we turn the patient to CPAP, what are some of the things that we'll want to uh, take note of to know whether they're going to quote, fly or not. Well, respiratory, you mentioned respiratory rate, and that's definitely one of them. So what should the respiratory rate be? So their frequency should be? Between 6 and 30. Hmm? Between 6 and 30? Between 6 and 30? Yeah, I would say probably uh, that's a good range. I, I usually, I like to go by Dr. Chappell's uh, saying, has he, has he said this to you? If you're 28, you're too late. So I like, I like to use 28 as my cutoff. In fact, if you're 28 and above, you're really breathing too fast. So let's say, how about 6 to 24? 
respiratory rate. Okay, so they do have a respiratory rate. What about tidal volume? Now they're on the breathing machine, so I can measure their exhale tidal volume with each breath. How much tidal volume do I want? 5 ml per kilo. So let's say a 70 kilo man, that makes it what, 350? Yeah, I like that. That's good. That's good. Remember the first 150 cc's of ventilation is dead space. And so you want uh, more alveolar ventilation than you do dead space. So that means that you never want less than 300, I would think, for most average size people. So 350 I like. I like that 5 mils per kilo. That's a good one. Uh, some people will have more than that. So let's say we have a rate, uh, a minimum respiratory rate of 6 and a minimum tidal volume of 350. I'll put, write it in liters. So what is my VE? Okay, so you kind of know now what your minimum that you're going to expect is. Uh, what would be on the high side? What would be too much? So that's, that's kind of on the low side. What would be too much? Yeah, and generally they often say that between 10 and 12 liters per minute. If a patient is requiring 10 or 12 liters per minute, they're really having to work too hard that you question whether they're going to be able to come off and breathe on their own without uh, eventually fatiguing and going into respiratory failure. So that's, that's at least what the books uh, have quoted, 10 to 12 liters per minute. Okay. So between at a low of 3 to 4 and a high of 10 liters or 12 liters per minute is going to be your range of minute ventilation and we discussed the range. Now there's also that concept of the rapid shallow breathing index, the RSBI. Let's do that one. Let's do a couple of RSBIs. Okay. RSBI, which is mathematically, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, so let's do a couple, let's do a good one and a bad one so we can see what, we'll say uh, the good patient had a frequency of 12 and a tidal volume of 500. Perfect, perfect patient. So what do we get? 12 divided by 0.5. Okay. All right, let's put in some values for somebody we know is bad. Uh, so 32 would be bad over, let's say, how about three, 300, questionable. What do we get? 106.6. Now, does your book say, uh, so your book says, and uh, what, what reference is that for our viewers that are watching on, you, on YouTube? Is that from uh, Egan? Does Egan say o, RSBI of over 105? Uh, so, and I would agree with that, yeah. Yeah. So really, a lot. Some doctors uh, in in facilities where I've been will say over 100, an RSBI of over 100. Again, all we're doing is we're looking at the respiratory rate and the tidal volume together. You can look at them independently too and come up with the same sorts of decisions that you're going to make.